Hi everyone, welcome to today's Jack's Career Chat. My name is Christina Valianatos. I am a genomics educator in the Division of STEM and Undergraduate Education at the Jackson Laboratory. I'm really pleased to be hosting today and welcome the, our guest, Linda Steinmark, who is a genetic counselor and also a project manager at Jax's Clinical Education. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for where, asking me. Where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from my home because of the COVID-19 situation. Yep, yep, and you're in Connecticut, right? Yes, I am. Yep, yep, we're all, all home. Great, um, so Linda, tell us a little bit about your job because um, you kind of have two jobs, right? So you're trained as a genetic counselor, but now you're working in education. That's right, so um, at Chax, I'm working with a clinical and continuing education team where we um, develop online and in-person education for other healthcare providers. So doctors, nurses, PAs, um, in all areas of genetics and genomics. And that education comes uh, both online and in person, is that That's right? That's right. And how do you balance your uh, education job with your genetic counseling responsibilities? Well, I, I, when I took this job at Jax about three years ago, I was really excited about it, but I was also a little bit sad that I wouldn't be working with patients any longer. And so we worked it out and I was able to keep one day as a, in my clinical role at the cancer center. Where I okay. counsel patients. Yes, I counsel patients about hereditary cancer susceptibility. So in your work week, you have one day where you spend in the clinic still seeing patients? That's right. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's a good balance. And so uh, what, does, what does a typical day at uh, each of your jobs look like? So um, at your clinical education job at Jax, and then also in the clinic as a genetic counselor. So at Jax, which is my main job, um, it's a very collaborative team that we work really closely together to develop our educational programs. And uh, we work with a, an instructional designer who keeps us honest and keeps us focused on just what people need to learn and the best way to learn it. So we're really collaborative and work together to develop these projects. And um, so, you know, my day is balanced between meetings with my team, some really focused work with research and writing, and um, just then managing and moving projects forward. So a lot of teamwork, a lot of meetings. Yeah, yeah, but I like that it's balanced with that focused work too, where I can really dig into the science and, and updates and things like that. And what type of education do you guys provide? Like what exactly are you, are you doing and who's your audience? So our audience are healthcare providers, and a lot of them are primary care, um, all those different roles I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And then we have a number of programs in oncology as well. So two of our major online programs are um, a cancer clinical education suite of modules. Each one of those modules is case-based and takes about 15 minutes to complete. And then nurses and physicians can get continuing education credit for free using those. And then the other main online project is in precision medicine. And so that goes anywhere from prenatal genomics, neurogenomics, um, direct-to-consumer testing, um, exploring other technologies. So we've got um, seven modules in that series. And those are a little bit longer. Those take about half an hour to complete. That's a, that's a really big variety of, uh, of topics that you guys cover. Yeah, and we're always looking for even more variety because it's interesting. And so uh, the healthcare providers that take these courses, um, you mentioned continuing education. So that means um, uh, credit so that they have to take courses like this for their own uh, career advancement. Exactly. So when you're in any medical field, you need to maintain your certification. And so the national bodies keep track of the things that you do and um, provide um, I guess, authorization for credit for certain courses. And so you're, we work within that system to make sure that when people are doing these programs, they also get credit to um, further their continuing education requirements. That's great. Yeah. So what about your genetic counseling job? What's a typical day look like? And what are some of the things that you do there? It's very busy. So it's, um, 
a lot of rushing as many clinical jobs are, but then what I like is once you sit down and you're focused with your patient in that conversation, it all drops away and it, it just melts away. And it's just that conversation and that relationship that you build with that patient to understand what their concerns are, what brings them there, how genetics might play a role in helping them to understand their health risks so that they can manage those appropriately. Okay, so what exactly is a genetic counselor? So you're saying that you're seeing patients and that you're advising them about uh, genetic conditions. Um, so what, what exactly does a genetic counselor do? So I can tell you maybe just by what I do and you can expand it to other areas of genetic counseling. So um, we'll have a referral for someone um, by a physician or a, a, a mid-level provider like a PA or a nurse practitioner that recognized a pattern of cancer in the family that might be concerning. And so they'll come to us and we'll start, you know, assessing what their concerns are, what brings them there, um, how they might use this information to guide their health care. So they might do more cancer screening or even surgeries. They might discuss this with their family who might also be at increased risk. And um, it really can change outcomes for them, which is really, really um, satisfying for me because that's the reason I got into this is I wanted to make sure that when I was doing this work that it was making a difference in people's lives and so genetic counseling definitely does. It sounds like a really impactful career choice um, and a, a really important one in the medical field uh, and one that is similar to a lot of other healthcare jobs in terms of seeing patients having a role in care like you said it is that, but it's also education, right? I was thinking about that before we met today. And a big piece of what we do is educating patients that we meet with about genetics. They may not know very much about it or how it could impact their lives. And so it's, it's a conversation, but it's also education. And then on the flip side, we find ourselves educating those providers so they know when to refer to us, what's concerning. Um, so and why it's important. So so there's a lot of education involved in that role too. That's interesting that you say that. So it makes me wonder. You know, maybe this is uh, kind of a perfect bridge for being a genetic counselor and then uh, having your current role in education. So how did you how did you make that shift um, to coming to Jax and working in the in the education department? So the education team was. Um, putting on a um, program in Connecticut. And they asked me to be one of the um, presenters of this program. And I got to know them and I got to realizing as I looked out at the nurses who were in this program that I could have much more of an impact by helping them understand what was important to look for in risk assessment than just seeing one patient at a time. And yet I couldn't give up that patient piece of it either. So it sounds like you found a way to even continue doing more education than what you were doing uh, by seeing patients expand that, but then also keep that that patient to patient contact that you were right exactly. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about how you got here. So it sounds like this is a really um, a really nice career path for you, and and you know you got to be able to educate the people around you and the healthcare providers as well as patients, and you get to have that uh, impact on patients' lives. But did you always know that this is what you wanted? Were you always interested in being a genetic counselor or an educator? How did you get to where you are? I never thought about myself being an educator at all before this. Um, I always loved genetics, even in high school. It just I always loved genetics, and um, I did not always know I would be a genetic counselor. It took me a long time to find my way around to this. And so I can tell you a little bit about that path if you're interested. If you yeah, yeah, time. absolutely. Um, <laughs> I think that's a common question that uh, a lot of our high school students that we work with have is, you know, you, you see people in jobs and that are very satisfied in their jobs. And, you know, you might think, oh, well, they've are always known that that's what they want to do and they're so good at what they do. But the reality is that a lot of us have very winding paths and it takes us a while to, to get to where we are. So, yeah, please tell us. Okay, so it was definitely a winding path. And so um, I love biology. I grew up near the ocean. And so one of my favorite classes was a marine biology class in high school. So that was a lot of fun. And so it made me realize science could be fun. It's not all just, you know, the grind of it. Like we really did actual experiments out in boats and, and things like that. So it was fun. Oh, wow. Um, that in high school? Yeah. Yeah. So that was probably what, one of the unique things about where I went otherwise it was a very typical high school experience. 
Um, so I went to college, I majored in biology. My plan was to go to graduate school, which I did. I went for, to a program for a PhD in molecular biology and genetics, and I was really unhappy. <laughs> And I wasn't expecting that to happen because I'd worked in a lab that I loved while I was in college. My mentor was great, um, but it just, it didn't click with me. I was very frustrated with it. Wow, so you made the choice after college to go to graduate school, but after your first year, you just weren't feeling it. It just wasn't a good fit. Right, right. So and so it was a big decision to leave it because I, it was like you said, I thought that I was supposed to pick a career and move towards it. and. I wasn't happy. I realized it was a really long path until I had my PhD, my postdoc, you know, being an assistant professor and then having job security eventually. And I knew for me that wasn't the right path. It was just a long time of not being happy. So, so that path you would have been on if you continued in grad school. Right. And it just, when you're not happy, that path just looks really daunting. So I left that and I ended up working in science publishing because we were living near New York. So I worked in Manhattan for a um, academic publisher and I did that for a couple of years. And then just for personal reasons, we moved. And so I had a job doing um, research for a small consulting firm and just got my, you know, getting my feet on the ground in a new city. And um, one day I opened the newspaper and the Chicago Tribune and they highlighted a career every Sunday and uh, they highlighted medical photography. Like, oh, this looks like so much fun. I love photography. I've always loved it. And it's got the slant that I've always been interested in. So I called them up. I met with them. I worked with them the whole time we lived in Chicago. They started a new company, which was a stock photography company where we set up all sorts of healthcare and um, other situations where art directors would come and buy existing images rather than hiring a photographer to go out and shoot what they needed. So it worked for everybody because we had this stock of, of images that people could choose from rather and save money, but then we were able to sell those. So that was really fun. I, you know, I had a lot of fun with that. And I then realized um, that I was home with our kids for a couple of years, not working. I'm sorry. Oh no, I'm, I'm sorry. I think there was a connection lag. I just was saying um, I had never heard of medical photography before and that sounds like a really, uh, really fun job and something really different. It is. There's a program at Rochester. So the, uh, my friend who ran the company went to Rochester. So they have a medical illustration and medical photography program. So that's something people can look into if they've never considered that before. Okay. And, and it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot about photography. You know, we were always crawling around, plugging things in under tables and moving lights around. And so it was very active and, and, and really enjoyed it. Um, but um, took some time off for my career when the kids were little. And when I went back, I wanted to do something more meaningful. And while I was having fun with the photography and I could have continued it, I really wanted to do something that would have more impact on people's lives. And I went back to thinking about genetics because I always had enjoyed that. And I had heard about genetic counseling way back when I was looking at graduate school. And so I looked into it again. I applied to one program because it was January and the, the um, applications were due in three weeks. And I'm like, well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. And I can be more planful if it doesn't work. But it worked. And so I went to um, graduate school. I went to Sarah Lawrence. And I ended up with a master's in human genetics. So you had taken then several years between finishing undergrad, leaving your PhD program, working, and then going to get your master's. Right. So my kids were late elementary and middle school when I went back to school for the master's. Was that difficult to leave your PhD program, be out of school for many years, and then go back and get your master's? at a Everything at a changed. Genetics moved so fast. Everything changed. But in a way, that was really fascinating because I had a lot to learn. And what made your first year in the genetic counseling program different than, <clears throat> excuse me, different than your first year in the PhD program? It's really funny because Sarah Lawrence is probably one of the larger programs for genetic counseling. And we had 23 people from all over the world. And all of us had that same experience working in labs and getting frustrated, but loving genetics and still wanting to be involved. And so I found my people, right? I, I realized I was with people that were like-minded and had that same focus to use genetics to help people. 
That's awesome. So it sounds like you found a, a much more fulfilling career path. Right, right. And it really was great because when I was in grad school, I loved the journal clubs and I loved planning the experience, experiments. And so you still got that intellectual curiosity piece fulfilled by doing this because you need to stay up on genetics and on the technology, but you need to also make it approachable for the lay public. So that's actually where that education piece starts to come in. Um, and I just really enjoy that a lot. So how does this uh, career path that you chose, genetic counseling, how does it fit your skills and interests? You talked a little bit about, you know, your, your desire for um, improving the lives of people in education. Is there anything else that it really, really fits you as a person? Um, that's a really good question. I have to think about that. That's a big question. Um, because why am I so satisfied with this and why am I happy? And that's hard to describe, you know, but I just know that it's, it's the right path. Yeah. I, I, I look forward to every day. I don't like dread getting up out of bed. I don't mind if things go late. Um, you know, every job has its frustrations. You know, when you're working in a hospital, there can be some roadblocks and you have to work those out. Um, but you know, overall, it's something I, I continue to enjoy doing and that's really important to me. So looking back, is there, you know, is there anything that you would like to tell yourself when you were in high school or when you were an undergrad or anything that, uh, you know, you would give yourself advice if you had to do it over again? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I would, I would say, you know, just, I would say be more flexible and allow yourself some space and to understand that you don't have to decide right away what the rest of your life is going to look like. And in fact, I think that's better because then you're open to new opportunities. And if something comes up, you can look at that with an open mind and really learn something new and learn something new about yourself. That's great advice. And it seems like, you know, it was really helpful for you. You listened to yourself when your PhD program wasn't really fitting and you decided to leave school um, and even getting your, your various jobs, you know, finding that ad for the medical photography or, or deciding to go back to school and get your master's in your 40s. So that's, that's great advice. I think it's very relatable for a lot of people. Yeah, and it doesn't come right away. You know, like when I decided to go back to grad school when the kids were a little older, it took me a couple of years to figure out exactly what felt right. And then when I knew, I knew. And I know that doesn't sound scientific. I didn't you know, make spreadsheets or do anything like that. Um, but yeah, I think overall it worked out really well. It can be really reassuring, especially now when everyone seems to, you know, know exactly what they want and everything's so competitive that if you just take a step back, keep your mind open to opportunities, things kind of turn up and, and you can listen to yourself and find a good path for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a great message for people to hear. Well, that's great, Linda. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk and share with us about your uh, career path and your, your current role at JAX and in the clinical world. Um, thank you so much, and uh, I'll see you around. Yes, definitely. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.